Good morning, everyone. Hello. Uh, so good to see your beautiful faces. Seems like just a moment ago I was here. Oh, actually, it's the truth. Go ahead and uh, grab your seats. On the way down, give someone a fist bump because that's totally politically correct right now in our current climate. Fist bumps are appropriate. Well, g'day everyone. Yes, I am an Australian. Um, I was born and raised in the Gong. Yeah, and uh, I am a dairy farmer's daughter. And I married a man from Dapdo, the original Dapdo dog. He's going to be preaching here tonight, Jürgen Matesius. I think we have a, a photo of my family. So I've been living in the United States for the last 15 years. My husband and I planted a church over there. Here's my family. I, don't, I actually don't have any family photos of us all together. I, I'm shocking at photos. So we had to get a collage to so, show you who everybody is. This is my, the middle, the middle photo there is my husband with my three sons and then a little collage of all my boys, my footballer, my married boy, my eldest son, Jordan, and then my little girl, Zoe, who came as the most beautiful surprise after we thought we were having done, ha, done having babies. So she's a beautiful girl. So that's my family. Just wanted to introduce you to them. Um, but it's a delight to be here with you this morning. We've had the most magnificent time and I count it a great honour to be able to bring the Word of the Lord to you today. And now when I preach, um, I, I don't necessarily bring that message number one that I know is just going to make everybody fall in love with me. I do want you to love me, I'm not going to lie. However, I, I want to bring the Word of the Lord to you today. And, and as I was praying and preparing this morning, I just felt the Lord drop a word into my spirit for you. And the word is, stand your ground. I am kind of, um, in some ways, a one note preacher. I'm all about preparing people for the fight and the battle. And the Lord has gifted me with an ability to be able to be there for people, sometimes in the midst of their worst crises. You ask me to come to your wedding, I may come. You ask me to come to your bedside when you're dying, oh baby, I'll be there. I will be there with the anointing oil, with the communion cup, and we're going to believe God for a breakthrough. Um, but I want to share with you from a story found in the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter number 32 today, about one of my favourite kings. His name was King Hezekiah. And the Bible says that King Hezekiah came into power in a time where, where Israel had really lost the plot. The church had lost its influence. It had literally become a literal garbage dump. And when King Hezekiah came into power, the first thing he did was clean up the church and restore it as a place of worship again. And he just did some incredible acts. But then in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, we see this happen. And this is where we're gonna pick up the story. It says, after these deeds of faithfulness, Sennacherib, who is the villain in this story, somebody say Sennacherib. Sennacherib. Yeah, king of Assyria came and entered Judah and he had camped against the fortified cities thinking to win them over to himself. So this to me already smacks of a bit of drama because you'd think after Hezekiah has been incredibly faithful that the devil would leave him alone. Like, like how dare the devil touch someone who was living in such obedience and consecration to God. And this is where I feel the prophetic part of this message is going to kick in because I felt the Lord say today to tell people in this room, some of you are facing a ferocious attack, but fear not, don't be action, anxious. An attack is not a rebuke from the Lord. Some of you facing an attack and you're thinking, oh God, like, what did I do? I, I don't understand. I, I want you to understand today that the Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. And I wish it wasn't in there. I wish that wasn't true. I wish that on this side of eternity, when you became a believer, you never had another bad day, but I'd be lying to you and I'm a pastor and I can't lie. <laughs> but then that scripture goes on to say, but the Lord will deliver you out of them all. So I don't know what you're facing today, but your heavenly Father does, and He has sent me with a message of deliverance. We are not a powerless church. 
We don't have to take what the devil dishes out and just lay over and go, hit me baby one more time. We can stand up in our strength and actually proclaim the Word of God. Yeah. What did Jesus say in the book of Luke? I have given you all authority. I'm gonna get a bit extra because I've lived in America for 15 years and it's in my waters now. I have given you all authority over the power of the enemy. I want you to know today you are an empowered believer. And we've never been in a more imperative time for believers to believe and believe in the strength of the God that they serve. So Hezekiah is facing this formidable, very sophisticated enemy who had taken out many nations before him. He's got this fortified city. He's done everything right and the enemy comes against him and the Bible says the enemy's purpose was to make war against them and to win the city for himself. Sometimes the greatest battle of our lives, my friends, is not to take ground, but to stand our ground. And I don't know what your 2019 looked like, but I know that God has a victory for you in your 2020. And sometimes the battle isn't so much that you're kicking goals and you're hashtag beast mode and you tick all the prayer requests on your vision card and bam, boom, bam, pow, look at me. It's, often it's just like you get through the end of a year and you stand up and you shake yourself off from the ashes of the horror that was the year before and just say, well, thank God I'm not dead. I'm still living. Sometimes the battle is to stand your ground. And I came as a messenger of the Lord today to put faith on the inside of you. When the world is afraid, God is raising up a fearless church. Amen. So I wanna bring four keys of what Hezekiah did because he didn't just let go, oh well, the enemy's sophisticated and he's beaten a whole lot of people before me. I guess I might as well just open the gates and let him in. No, he, he, he waited on God for a strategy in order to have victory and stand his ground and hold firm in the place that God had given him. So in 2 Chronicles 32 verse three, it says this, when Sennacherib had come and his purpose was to make war, King Hezekiah consulted with his leaders and commanders to stop the water from the springs which were outside the city and they helped him. Thus many people gathered together who stopped all the springs and the brook that ran through the land saying, why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? And it's a really great question. Right here, under the help of the great council that King Hezekiah had around him, they came up with a winning strategy. Why are we resourcing and feeding the enemy that is trying to take us out? There was a cistern or a river flowing out of Judah that was now resourcing the enemy that was trying to take them over. So my question to you today is, are you feeding what you should be starving? So so when the enemy comes against you, are you making his job so much easier because you're fueling him instead of starving him? Because a weak enemy is a very easily defeated enemy. And there will come times in our lives when the enemy comes in like a flood, when we have to ask, in what way could I potentially be sustaining or feeding or resourcing the enemy that is coming against me? I had to ask myself that question as a young pastor and a young mum. And I used to love coming home from a hard day at work, putting my feet up, grabbing the, the gossip magazines and flicking on the Real Housewives. Oh, nothing, nothing filled my soul in a more perverted way than watching those things, than reading about the dysfunction and the drama and the trauma of others. But then one day, God kind of entered my messy situation, my self-indulgent situation, and he said, Leanne, I want you to stop feeding yourself on that stuff. And initially, I, I was like, no. Like, hang on, this, God, this is all I have. I don't smoke, smoke. I do smoke, but I don't smoke. I've only ever had sex with one man in my whole life. I don't swear that much. This is, this is, my, this is my one thing. You want to take my one thing away from me? And I felt the Lord say to me, Leanne, I've, I've actually raised you up to be a deliverer 
for women from these idols that have them in bondage and keep them in dysfunction. And you cannot feed the enemy that I'm asking you to starve and bring down. So I wonder today, in that kind of very shallow story, however, had a big impact on my life, what areas of your life are you feeding the enemy that you should be starving? When God came to Gideon in the book of Judges, before he could take on the four different enemies that had kept Israel in oppression for four years, he said, first, Gideon, you're going to have to pull down the idols in your father's house. You cannot entertain or worship the enemy or feed the enemy that I am calling you to bring down. I believe that's the word of the Lord for somebody today. What enemy are you feeding that you need to be starving? I say under the name of the Lord, cut off the enemy's fuel supply. Do not sustain him or refresh him anymore because a weak enemy is an easily defeated enemy. Boom, boom, pow. Point number two, repair the broken walls. Second Chronicles 32.5 says this, and then Hezekiah strengthened himself. And I want to stop there just for a minute because I know Hillsong Church has been priming the pump with Spirit, um, Holy Spirit month, week, season for a long time. And let me tell you, we felt it. We felt it in Color Conference. We came in and there was already a roar. The, the pump had already been primed for God to do something magnificent in the lives of of his daughters. I want to say to you today, the greatest way you can strengthen yourself when the enemy comes in and you're standing your ground is to pray in the Spirit, to allow the Spirit of the Lord to pray through you. The Bible says there are sometimes we just do not know how to pray as we ought. But when you pray in the Spirit, when you pray in tongues, you pray the perfect prayer every time. It's not a prayer that's led by fear. It's a prayer that is spirit breathed and you speak faith and you speak a prayer that will literally shatter the army of the enemy that stands before you. The Lord spoke to me at the beginning of the year and said, Leanne, if you will discipline yourself to pray in the spirit for 15 minutes a day, I will change your life in ways that you will not be able to quantify. And since that point, I felt myself strengthened in so many different areas. So right here, Hezekiah strengthened himself. But the point I want to make is that he repaired the broken walls. And I think this is something that many times in church we can fail to truly speak into. And the truth is, we all come to Jesus with areas of brokenness. But we come to him because he's a healer and he fixes what is broken. And I believe that God is wanting a resurgence of people who, like King David, say, oh God, search me, know me, test my every fearful thought and see that there be no wicked way within me. God has something magnificent for each of us to do in our lifetime, something unique, but something magnificent. And if, in order for us to see it, realize we have to allow the Holy Spirit to help us repair the places of brokenness in our lives. King Hezekiah knew that he, if he didn't repair the broken walls, what would happen was the enemy would be able to have access. And I found that the enemy, the devil, always follows the path of least resistance. And for me, as a young pastor's wife, I was living in New Zealand. I got married at 17. I was a fetal bride and then had my first baby at 19 went straight into ministry to the nation of New Zealand. And, you know, it was, it was quite a heavy burden to be in marriage as a 17-year-old and ministry at the same time. And through a certain series of events, I got very affected by some of the nastier side of, sides of church and ministry life. I didn't yet have the maturity to be able to properly process a lot of things that were happening. And so as a result, I became very jaded and very affected and very embittered. And I made vows in my heart, this will be my husband's thing, but it won't be mine. I'll be the dutiful wife, I'll do what needs to be done, but I will never really let them have my heart. I had a crack in my wall. Anyway, about the same time, my husband was called up to be ordained officially into the Assemblies of God movement. 
So we drove to a small town in New Zealand to go through the ordination process and we were in the ceremony and I was standing there with my husband and we walked on stage and we shook hands with the dignitaries and had photos taken and we were there with probably about another 20 couples who were being ordained along with all their family members. Then we went and sat down and my husband was officially an AOG pastor. And as we were sitting down, we were waiting for the service to end, they got up an American preacher who all of a sudden just started to flow in the spirit and said, you know what, there are people here today and you've got a broken part of your heart that God wants to heal. He wants to restore the broken places of your heart and he wants you to be vulnerable with him today and he wants you to return to him. He wants you to, to come back to a place of full salvation and trust in him. And nobody's moving. Everybody's looking at this guy like he's lost his mind because, oh my gosh, this is a room full of pastors. They've got all their stuff together, surely. They're as pure as the wind-driven snow. <laughs> this guy's completely missed it. And as he's speaking, everybody else is kind of looking around awkwardly going, oh my gosh, he's missed it, he's missed it. That's why we should have got a Kiwi to preach and not an extra American. <laughs> but as he was speaking, I felt the lamp of the Lord come upon me. Just like the Bible says, the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching the innermost places of his heart. And, and I, couldn't, I couldn't deny this message was for me. But I have to set the scene because I want you to know nobody else is moving. Everybody is thinking this American has missed it. But then I stand up. I am in a blindingly bright white suit. <laughs> you could not miss me if you try. And then I go to walk forward because I'm like, oh my gosh, it's me, it's me, it's me. God's calling me up, like he's got my number. And my husband, who is never afraid of what anybody thinks, in fact, I pray for the day that he will care what other people think, <laughs> looks at me as I start to make a move and he's like, Leanne, Le Leanne, Leanne, no, 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 no. I was, I was just on that stage. We were getting ordained as pastors on the stage. Everybody was looking at us. He's like, please, 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 I'll, I'll pray for you at home. I'll, pray. I'll, even, I'll even baptize you in the bathtub, please come back. I just knew. In my blindingly bright white suit as I walked forward, you could have seen me from the moon. But I remember just collapsing and look, this American preacher was like loving it because he's like, yes, I did hear from God. And he's like, oh, come to Jesus. Hmm. Little last lamb coming to the flock. And I, I just collapsed at his feet part way from just embarrassment, but also God, let, let this be done. Father, I surrender to you. Father, heal the crack in my wall. I don't want the, the devil to make me bitter anymore. And you know what? I look back at that moment as a significant time in my life that made me the woman I am today. I'm not here because of my education. I'm not here because I'm the greatest orator in the world, but I have been a woman who has set her heart to worship to say, oh God, whatever crack is in me, I'm gonna let you fix it. I'm gonna be vulnerable, I'm gonna be transparent, I'm gonna open up my life to you. And sometimes in church, we can think it's all about image and how we look on the outside, it's not. God, God doesn't want you to look right. He, he wants you to be whole. He, he, he desires truth on the inner man, the Bible says. And, and I attest to that moment, that very embarrassing moment at that ceremony many, many years ago as to the reason I am not a bitter pastor's wife sitting on the back row, swirling a coffee cup like a witch's brew, <laughs> scowling at the parishioners. You ruined my life. -a. They can't because my life doesn't belong to them. It belongs to him and oh Father, when I come to you broken, you fill me up again. My joy is not for sale and neither is my peace. I'm a woman of God who is called. I'm not gonna let the devil infiltrate my life by the crack in the wall. Come on, Australia. <laughs> Repair the broken walls. Oh, King Hezekiah was so smart. The Bible's so amazing. Point number three, we gotta be aware of the devil's schemes. And again, we can have a bit of a culture where we don't like talking about the devil and I get it. I understand. We don't wanna have more conversations about him than are necessary. But at the same time, we have to understand that Jesus spoke about him. 
and he called him out and made a distinction between who the devil was and who he was. He said in John 10, 10, it's the thief, the devil, who has come to kill, steal, and destroy. But I, I've come to give you life and life in abundance. So we need to be careful of his schemes. We see here in 2 Chronicles 32, 14, that it says that as Sennacherib's servants, the devil's servants, spoke against the Lord God, interesting, it's the spirit of the mocker, which is alive and well in all the nations of the earth. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And against his servants, please listen to that today. The enemy doesn't just speak against God, he speaks against his servants. He also wrote letters to revile the Lord of Israel and speak to him saying, as the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. And then they called out with a loud voice and fear and intimidation speak loudly. And they spoke in a loud voice in Hebrew. Now I'm assuming because they were Assyrian that they actually spoke Syrian. However, this is proof positive that the devil knows how to speak your language. He knows exactly what to say to put fear and terror in you. Be aware. That's why Jesus said, my sheep know the sound of my voice and a stranger's voice, they will not follow. And I believe a lot of the problems in the world today as it relates to fear and even what we're experiencing today is because we're more acquainted with the voice of the stranger than we are with the voice of our good shepherd. And that's got a shift, that's got a shift. Every single one of us can get the word of the Lord in us and we must. When fear speaks loudly, faith must rise with a louder voice and roar from the inside of us as we allow God to come and bring faith into the places of our heart that have been gripped by fear. When I moved to America 15 years ago, I told this story at the conference, so it's, I'm telling it again, but it's, it's worth retelling. I remember my first encounter with an American woman. And it's seared in my memory forever. It was like one of those David Attenborough-like documentaries, because I was at the pool with my kids. We just arrived, we're at a hotel, and nobody had told me that when you go to swim at a pool in America, you don't actually go to swim. You don't get your hair wet, and you're there to lay out or to attract a mate. So I'm, I'm jumping in and out of the pool with my boys. I got my one-piece swimsuit on, my hair's wet. I don't have a manicure or a pedicure. And then all of a sudden I see, I have my first encounter with an American woman. Spray tan, string bikini, abs of steel, high-heeled thongs by the pool. <laughs> so many jewels that she looked like Mr. T. And then she came up, American people are very friendly. And she said, oh, I noticed you have an accent. Um, why are you here? And I said, well, um, my, my husband and I have, have moved to America to start a church. And she said, well, well, don't we already have churches in America? I said, um, yes, I, I, I think you do. And um, what I've realized is that American women, are, they're kind of born with this innate confidence. And lo a lot of us Aussie and Kiwi girls are born apologizing. We're like, sorry, 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 sorry. So this is what I was encountering. And she, she had said to me, well, you, you, you're, you're here to start a church um, with your husband. You said you're a pastor. I didn't know that women could be pastors. What college did you go to? And immediately I was triggered. I could hear, this woman was just asking questions, but I could hear the voice of intimidation and fear behind it. I had to recognize it. I didn't in the moment, but later I did. And immediately I was triggered. Because I, I left school in the 10th grade. I don't have a college education. I all about stole a Bible college degree from Hillsong when I would sit in the lectures when my husband was, a, was, was in the college classes as a 16-year-old girl. But I just remember feeling so like, oh my gosh, I don't have a degree. I, I, I have nothing and I can hear fear and I, I'm about to plan a church. And, and, and I said, well, listen, I, um, I don't have a degree. See, um, 
um, in my church, if you um, just hang around long enough and <laughs> don't do too many things wrong, then eventually they're gonna make you a pastor. So that's my story. And she just looked at me and was like, till, 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 I don't understand. I have never wanted to push another person in the pool so much in my whole life. And it wasn't because of her, it was because of the insecurities in me, because I wasn't recognizing the voice of fear and intimidation. And God was asking me to stand my ground. And I remember going back to my room and just feeling so despondent and actually so mad at God. God, why did you send me here? Why did you send me here? I'm nothing like these women. They've all got degrees. They're all super intelligent and I'm me. I still don't know which one is the greater than or the less than crocodile. Like why, why? <laughs> and I felt God so strongly rebuke me and say, Leanne, how long are you gonna listen to that spirit of fear and intimidation and bow your knee to the call of God that is on your life? I did not send you here to bring America more of what America's already got. I sent you here to be you, now stop it. We have to understand that the enemy works through intimidation and he knows your language. What's your trigger to wait today? Be aware of the enemy's schemes. I'm gonna ask the band to come up and join me as we close this message down. The final thing we need to do is we need to pray and release the situation to God. When the enemy comes in like a flood and you're in a fight to stand your ground, yes, cut off the enemy's fuel supply. Yes, allow the Holy Ghost to come in and rep repair those places of brokenness. Yes, identify when the enemy is speaking and do not be intimidated by his voice. But when you've done everything you can do, it's time to just rest and let God do everything that he can do. Let me end by telling you a story that I believe is going to put faith in your heart today. My husband and I have been in ministry for 28 years, as long as we've been married. The first 14 years of our ministry life, we were youth pastors. We were in South Auckland serving in a church over there as youth pastors, and God had spoken to my husband that he was going to give us a house. Now, you don't go into youth ministry or really ministry at all because it pays so well. Um, we were not poor, we were beyond poor. We were like, here's poor, and Jürgen and I were down here groveling somewhere in rags, eating things off the dollar menu. So that's how poor we were. We earned, I think, a combined total of $18,000 a year. But because my husband was a man of faith, he attended Power Ministry College, so he had like a residue of faith on the inside of him. He said, Leanne, God's gonna give us a house. Through a series of very bizarre circumstances, we're presented with an opportunity to buy a house in Manurewa, South Auckland, for $120,000, which was a miracle because the house was actually worth $200,000. And so it was, it was just like this incredible opportunity. But the only thing was, was we didn't have $120,000. We didn't have a deposit. We didn't even have two cents to rub together. But we just knew that this was the Word of the Lord, that this was our ground and to fight for it. And so we did our due diligence and we tried everything we could in our own strength and then we left it in the hands of the Lord. The, the owners of the home so fell in love with us, they said, look, we're gonna let you move into the house and we're gonna work out the payment. We're gonna work it out, we're confident. So we moved in and I'd already ripped up the carpet and pulled down the wallpaper. Then we heard from the local mortgage insurance saying, we cannot give you a mortgage, you, you can't be insured. You're too much of a risk. You're gonna to have to move out of the home. I mean, they didn't know I'd already like tore the place apart. I, it was already a Chip and Joanna Gaines situation. So we were devastated, like, what are we gonna do? And we tried everything we could in our own strength. But then God reminded us, Jürgen and Leanne, you have tithers' rights. You've got seed in the ground and now is the time to look to me for a harvest. The Bible says in Malachi 3.10, when you bring your tithe into the storehouse, that God will open the floodgates of heaven and pour down upon you so much blessing that there will not be room enough to contain it and He will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. So we started praying and believing and standing in the gap and still nothing happened. The final day came when we had to give our answer to the owners of the house. 
Jürgen went to meet with them with his cap in his hand, literally having to say to them, I have, I've done everything I can in my own strength. I do believe this was provision from the Lord, but I just don't know what to tell you. I'm so sorry. My wife has destroyed the house and we're going to have to give it back to you. Um, we can't get a mortgage. And we were sitting in, oh, my husband was sitting in the living room telling this story. And the couple who were elderly, not Christian, just looked at each other, kind of nodded. And then the man walked out to his bedroom and came back with a big plastic sock full of wads of cash. And he handed it over to my husband. And he said, you know, son, many, many years ago when my wife and I moved from Scotland to New Zealand, the realtor who sold us our first home gave us back his commission so we could buy furniture for our new house. For 50 years, I've been looking for an opportunity to pay it forward. Here's $20,000, go buy my house. I wanna tell you today, when you've done everything you can, we have not exhausted the resources of heaven. I wanna put faith on the inside of you today. When the enemy comes in like a flood, stand your ground, the Lord is with you. The Bible says that God sent one angel. When King Hezekiah and Isaiah, the son of Amos prayed, heaven heard and heaven responded. And God sent one angel who struck down every mighty man in the camp of Assyria. And then Sennacherib, the devil, retreated to his own land and was struck down by some of his own offspring there. I'm here to bring a report of victory. You're gonna get through. God is on your side. If it was not for the Lord who was on our side, when men came against us, they would have swallowed us alive, but God is with you. God is for you. I come with a message of victory and faith, Australia. I feel God stirring the waters of this great nation. Can God do it? Yes, He can. And He wants to. And my life is testament. I'm not telling you anything I haven't experienced myself. And the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons, but He is a respecter of His principles. Will you lean into Him today? Don't roll over and let the devil ride roughshod over you, your family, your children, your health, your finances. Stand your ground, stand your ground, stand your ground, stand your ground, stand your ground. I believe in this room, some miracles and some great victory stories are gonna come. Don't put your sword down just when God is about to send in the battalion and bring about a great deliverance. Things are gonna work out. Everything's gonna be okay. Be at peace, be at peace, be at peace. If you're here today and you're in the midst of a battle to stand your ground, this is not a ground taking battle, this is a ground standing battle. I want you to stand to your feet. I wanna pray for you real quickly. Yeah. Courage and strength is yours today. Courage and strength. The Lord is with you, you mighty men and women of valour. The Bible says, through our God, we shall do valiantly, for it is He who will tread down our enemies. Do you know that Hezekiah didn't even need to pull out his sword in battle? Not one single Israeli life was lost. God did the fighting for them. He pushed back the darkness. And what He did for Hezekiah, He's gonna do for you. Lift your hands to the Lord. Father, I thank You right now. Your presence is here. I thank You for strength and honour. Yes, this couple, I see the hand of the Lord is upon you. Daughter, fret not, I hear the Lord saying, God's moving in your situation. He delights in you, He loves you, He loves you. I just hear the Lord saying, don't be afraid. And also wanting to just say how proud He is of you for being a strong leader in your home. The Lord's proud of you, sir. He's proud of you. You're a man of great strength. God's gonna lead you and He's gonna guide you and He's gonna bring you through. Fear not and nothing will be lost. I hear the Lord saying, nothing will be lost. He's a restorer of everything the enemy steals. Thank You, Lord. And for every hand lifted right now, right now in Jesus' Name, I thank You for a powerful touch of Your anointing and strength to come upon your sons and your daughters today in Jesus' mighty Name. Somebody give God a shout. Give Him a shout of praise. God's moving, God's moving, God's moving, yeah, yeah. Almost done, Kaz and Richard, would you stand to your feet? I had a word for you this morning. I just saw a picture. God is so pleased with your faithfulness. 
And I just see another anointing coming upon your life. And it's not to replace one, it's an addition. And the additional anointing is an anointing of deliverance upon your lives. Because God's heard the cry of His people who are suffering with great oppression. And it's gonna, and I hear the Lord saying, don't be afraid. It's not gonna look how you think it's gonna look. Um, because within the two of you, you are stewards of excellence and nuance. It's almost gonna be the deliverance you have when you don't know you're having deliverance. Because the Bible says that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. And we're in a season where the enemy is oppressing a lot of people, but the church has backed up a little bit globally from this because sometimes it's just it's a little bit awkward, but it's not gonna be awkward. It's gonna be so natural. It's gonna be so right. Lift your hands to the Lord. Father, I thank You. Richard and Cass, deliverers, deliverers, deliverers. I just see the enemy running. When you walk in the room, the devil's gonna walk out. When you enter, demons are gonna flee. You will not even really have to raise your voice. There is an authority and a mantle and an increase coming on your lives. You are deliverers, deliverers, deliverers. You're gonna set the captives free. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Lord. God bless them. God bless them in Jesus' Name. Is Pete still here? Pete, I'm gonna hand back to you, but I wanna say this one thing. Peter, you're a man of God. You're a man of God who is married to a woman of God. And that picture of Gideon is a picture of you. And God raised up Gideon because of the beauty of his heart. And I just see there is strength and honour on the inside of you. And we're in a culture that has been a little bit affected by fame with, with some ministers who who love crowds, but they don't love people. Within you is the heart of a shepherd. And right now is the raising of the season of the return of the shepherds, because there is nothing more than, that God loves than His kids. And within you, He's found the heart of a shepherd. And I see, Pete, that you're gonna carry two things very strongly, truth and love, truth and love. We come from a generation that has tried to liberate people without truth, it's impossible. But you're gonna carry truth, but you're gonna carry love. Truth born or delivered from the womb of love. That's who you are, Peter. Get ready, we love you, you're amazing. Love you, Hillsong Church. Thank you for being the awesome light on a hill that you are. God bless you, have an amazing Sunday.